we've got our, our special speaker this month. Uh, Luther is uh, Luther Kruger is uh, he got an amazing, amazing collection of solar ovens and is doing all kinds of classes and connections uh, actually all over the world. And so we're really excited to have him. And uh, like Rich said earlier, we've actually got him in his backyard today. So that's going to be a, a new thing for us. And uh, and if you if you enjoy this, uh, we will be videotaping it and uh, putting it up on uh, our YouTube website so you can share it with friends and stuff. So uh, Luther, please take it over. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Doug and Rich and the whole uh, Minnesota Renewable Energy Society. This is really great. Um, I'm uh, definitely not a scientist. I'm not a techie, but uh, I am deep into solar cooking. Um, I'm getting into the design of it and uh, promoting of it all over all over the city of Minneapolis and where I can online. So uh, um, basically what I'm going to cover today, first thing, I'm going to share my screen with the PowerPoint so you'll see what I've got going here. I hope this will work. I hope that shows. Um, I'm going to describe uh, very briefly how solar cookers work. I won't get into the physics. Most of you can just uh, really browbeat me <laughs> on the science, uh, but the basics I'll talk about. Uh, we'll talk about the variety of different types of solar cookers there are, how they capture sun, how they focus it, concentrate it, and so forth. Uh, talk about the benefits of solar cooking both in this country and then also the critical need that uh, we have uh, in developing nations in particular. Uh, and then just my own personal opinion on how you can adopt solar cooking as part of your uh, environmental uh, green life um, and how you can spread the word amongst your neighbors uh, and, and around the community. So uh, without further ado, uh, we'll step forward here. I'm hoping this thing will let me, it's not letting me move it. Second here. Okay. Um, how do solar cookers work? Well, basically, if you understand uh, the energy, it's coming from the light. The light hits something to cook. And the cookers that are manufactured, they're designed to grab as much sun as possible. So if you have a parabolic cooker, for instance, it might be a meter or more worth of sunlight and it's concentrated into a spot maybe two, three, four, or five inches on the bottom of a pan. You might have a panel cooker that'll take, uh, who knows, a half a meter or more and focus it onto a, a pot that's inside uh, uh, some kind of greenhouse um, situation with a, a cooking bag or maybe two Pyrex bowls uh, laid one on top of the other. Um, box cookers, those are uh, basically a panel cooker with a box attached. The panels are the reflectors they grab all the sun that they possibly can uh, and put it into a box that's usually covered with uh, glass, uh, glazing of some sort, sometimes two layers of glass. And uh, they'll be insulated, so they'll capture as much, uh, they'll hold as much of that energy as possible for as long as possible. You can literally close the lid on a box cooker and it becomes a retained heat cooker, kind of like a hay box cooker. Um, I mentioned parabolics before. They're the most powerful. I'm actually going to uh, exit out of this. Uh, whoops, briefly, because uh, I want to show the biggest one I have right here. It's the SK-14 from Germany. It's about a meter and a half. And uh, you can put two, three, four gallons uh, worth of stew, soup, uh, whatever you want in it. Uh, uh, 1.4 meters across. The focal point is about maybe four or five inches on the bottom of the pot. Uh, very powerful cooker, one of the faster cookers out there, almost as fast as a, as a regular stovetop. Um, back to the PowerPoint here. Uh, I like this illustration. Uh, it's, uh, if I forget where I got it, I should have put the web reference up there. Basically, you can see that as the sun moves across the sky, if a cooker is designed really well, it's going to grab that sun and put as much of it onto the pot directly as possible. In this case, uh, panel cookers that maybe use tiffins uh, to cook in. They're stacked pots. That's one of the best ways to cook with a panel cooker because you can have two or three different dishes or a dish and a dessert and so forth uh, all together in one. Um, here are some panel cookers that are out there. The, these two right here are online. You can find them online. The designs are very simple. Uh, here's the illustration that I was talking about where it shows the sun moving across the sky 
and then the sunlight getting reflected onto the, onto the pots. Uh, and then here's two uh, really neat examples of panel cookers that are really easy to make. The designs are online. If you know anything about uh, how light travels, uh, you can practically think of these yourselves. The first one is basically two cones with uh, two different angles, one nested on top of the other with aluminized mylar, or you can use aluminum foil, anything very reflective that you just line that with. And in this particular case, it was one of the first ones I made where I put a, put a cake, uh, just a pound cake in a cake pan and then two uh, big uh, Pyrex uh, cake dishes um, uh, around it for the greenhouse. And uh, 250, 300 degrees maybe maximum, uh, but that's more than enough to cook. As you, if you know, uh, of course, everything starts cooking at about 170, 180, and uh, 200, 250 is really good for a slow cooker or for baking. Uh, the one on the right, uh, it's maybe a little more complicated design, but basically you just take a piece of cardboard, line it with aluminum foil, uh, slice it in the back in the right way, and you've got a uh, multi-angled uh, uh, panel cooker. And the same thing, to a uh, glass uh, dish with a pot inside, and you've trapped the heat. Uh, the one on the left in this one is the hot pot. It was made in Mexico. There is a uh, private company that is making it now. Uh, I forget what it's called, but if you do, uh, if you Google solar household energy hot pot, you'll find it's a fantastic panel cooker. It's the first one I got where I thought I was always skeptical of panel cookers, but this one sold me. It comes with its own glass bowl with an enameled pot that's nests in the bowl with about an inch inside and a glass lid. And uh, you set it out about nine in the morning where it's pointed toward about one o'clock for the sun and it will cook stew. I will put beef stew in a lot, where it'll by about four o'clock, five o'clock, it's ready for supper, piping hot, tender meat, uh, cooked almost to perfection. On the right is the uh, cook kit, which the Solar Cookers International promoted for a long time. The, uh, I think, I don't know if they still sell it or not, but uh, it's just a basic panel cooker. You put a pot into a cooking bag, uh, put the trivet underneath so it gets a little more light under the pot as well as the rest. Uh, and it cooks just as, it's like a slow cooker, like a crock pot. Uh, here's a, here are the plans for the cook it. Uh, very simple, uh, just get a big sheet of a uh, flute board or cardboard, uh, follow the directions, and you've got a cooker. Box cookers. Uh, this was my first shot uh, at solar cooking. Back in 04, I was visiting my brother in the Navy in Norfolk, and there was a store nearby called Tomorrow's World where he had solar cookers in the window. And I was able to pick up a book called Cooking with the Sun uh, by Beth and Dan Hallisey. And it's, uh, it's uh, plywood with a very simple, just a four by eight sheet of plywood. You just cl uh, cut it up correctly, nail it, glue it together, line it with cardboard, aluminum foil on the cardboard, sheet of glass over the top, and then that's just uh, plywood with uh, aluminum foil on the sides. And uh, I consistently got about 270, 280 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, cooked a lot with it. Gave, I made a bunch for our nieces and nephews. Dr drove all over the co country with these and handed them out to our nieces and nephews. A uh, very simple way to get started in solar cooking if you don't have a cooker yet and you want to make your own maybe $10, $15 worth of materials. Uh, another box cooker, this one I made myself. It's actually in my garage. Uh, a woman by the name of Barbara Kerr designed a cooker called the Through the Wall Oven. And hers actually stuck out like a box cooker mounted to a wall, and then the window was basically an access door in her kitchen. Now, she lived in Arizona, where she gets sun about every day but one out of the year, uh, so it was really simple for her to cook two or three meals a day in this cooker on her, uh, in her kitchen with a through-the-wall oven. Uh, my design challenge was I didn't want it sticking out from the wall because I parked my car back there, and uh, my wife's folks live with us, and... I didn't want to back into the cooker, uh, so I put it flat into the wall and I had to set reflectors up so they're extra wide so they grab sun throughout the day without having to move the cooker. Uh, and you can see from the thermometer there with the two sets of reflectors, just a pair, uh, 320 degrees, uh, not too bad. I'm, I'm very happy with that. Uh, I call it the sun portal because it's a, basically a, a window cooker. Uh, this is one of my favorites because of the uh, intent behind it, it's called the uh, sun stove. I by the name of David Wareham in South Africa uh, was trying to meet the challenge of getting a very inexpensive cooker with local materials. And his ingenious idea was he found printers who had worn out aluminum printing plates, uh, came up with a design on the right where the, you know, the solid lines are folding and the dotted lines are cutting. You just crimp it together, nest two of them together with a little insulation in between. 
uh, connect them together with just a couple boards and a sheet of uh, plexiglass over the top. And uh, that'll hit 220, 250, maybe more if you're uh, maybe closer to the equator and so forth. So a very inexpensive cooker. Every country, whatever materials they have, they're going to have printing presses somewhere where they're running out or the printing plates run out. Um, so very unique design. Another interesting thing with the story is he, he actually entered into a partnership with the Sappy Paper Company in South Africa. We also have Sappy Paper here in Minneapolis and northern Minnesota, or Minnesota, northern Minnesota. Uh, the partnership was Sappy Paper didn't want their employees pilfering wood from the, the forests that they were managing and the, and the pulp mills and so forth. And so what they did was they entered into a partnership with Sunstove to give one of these to every one of their employees, paid them the basic cost for putting them together. Uh, so a very interesting uh, solution to the problem of uh, both deforesting, uh, helping a company that wanted to responsibly manage uh, forest and so forth. And if it's you know, $10, $15 worth of materials outside of the free printing place, uh, I'd be surprised, very inexpensive. Uh, lately, a uh, few box cooker makers have, have uh, uh, been advancing the idea of a hybrid cooker. This one is the Ugly by David Chalker in New York. It's a box cooker, but also in the bottom, it's you can't see it here, but in the bottom there's actually a heating element, uh, very low heat, uh, but it's, it's, uh, I'm told that it's kind of like a, a heating element for 3D printers, where you need a heating element to solidify whatever you're printing. <coughs> and, uh, and so we set this up so it will cook, it'll hit 300 degrees Fahrenheit or more uh, in full sun, I have already done that. Uh, but if the sun goes away, clouds go out, you want to cook, keep cooking in the night, you just plug it in and it's a low and a high setting, just like a crock pot. Uh, pretty amazing. Uh, the two here, that you, one of those, two of these you might recognize have been the most popular around the country. On the left of the sun oven, it's made in Illinois, uh, probably been around 30 years or more. I vaguely recall seeing them in Popular Science magazine in the 80s in ads in the back when I was a kid. Uh, and the Solar Oven Society Sports, some of you maybe uh, met Mike and Martha Port. I, I understand they were past uh, presenters uh, to the uh, Renewable Society. Um, that one is kind of in limbo right now, but uh, it's made out of recycled pop bottles, um, and it'll hit 350 or even 400 if you put reflectors on it. Uh, very effective box cooker. Parabolics, I showed you the SK-14. That's the one I got a long time ago, maybe 15 years ago. Uh, sitting on our cracked up patio that we've since covered up with a decent deck um, and a uh, very nice uh, cooker uh, cooks large volumes of food gets high heat uh, very nice uh, little brake system on it where to adjust it you just have it on on casters like i have it on a platform and then you just tip it forward and the brake is just a real light friction brake that holds it in place you refocus it maybe every 15 20 minutes uh, to keep the heat on the pot and it's, uh, it's about a thousand degrees in the focal point. Whenever we have kids that are solar bunches, I make sure to put a stick in the focal point. So in about 10, 15 seconds, it bursts into flames. Uh, very clear illustration of uh, the power of the sunlight. Um, these are two, uh, they're, they're parabolics, uh, but they're with a Fresnel reflector. They take the bowl of a reflector and they flatten them out by keeping the angles in the strips around them. On the left, Sharon Clausen, who's the inventor of the Copenhagen uh, panel cooker, uh, she has probably made 15 or 20 cookers on her own, and this is one she uh, uh, she made up herself, uh, and it's effectively a parabolic cooker, but with a flat, uh, with a very thin uh, footprint uh, for the parabola, uh, but hits just as high a temperatures. The one on the right is one that I actually made from plants that are online, and it's uh, basically from kind of a masonite where you cut the circles to a certain uh, width and uh, uh, join them together with aluminum foil. And then that uh, the uh, rod at the top holds a pot over the focal point. Uh, every bit as good as a, a parabolic with a deep dish. Uh, this is one of my favorites. I'm kind of a fanatic about this one. Uh, Alain Bivas in France invented this in Simplicity. And uh, it's a parabolic of about 800 millimeters um, but if you look at the picture on the right at the bottom, the base is about an inch and a half thick. Everything there folds up and fits into that inch and a half thick by about 14 inches by 20 something inches. Only about nine pounds, eminently backpackable and uh, almost as powerful as a, as a, a larger parabolic. Um, I use it all the time in the, even in the winter where I'll set it out and I'll cook my breakfast. Uh, I think I have a picture later on maybe where I actually cook my breakfast. I had to keep moving it because of the, the shaft of sunlight between my house and my neighbors 
uh, it kept moving. I had to move the cooker to keep it in there, but after about a half an hour, I had my breakfast. Uh, this one, uh, invented by Steve Barron, uh, uh, Lou Yoder, out of uh, Zoneworks in Albuquerque, the Sun Flash. It's uh, on a stand uh, that, or it comes with a stand that's like a Christmas tree stand, uh, but a lot of people basically fix it into the ground, and uh, it's a parabola with a hole in the back. I, I should have had another picture here where uh, it's about a meter across, and the hole in the back is to make it a little more stable in the wind. That's the one problem with parabolics if they're set up pretty high. Uh, and the wind catches it, it can throw it all over your yard. So uh, uh, that one I got from uh, uh, another solar cooker fanatic in Oregon, uh, added to my collection because uh, there are only two that I know out there right now, uh, very effective uh, parabolic. Vacuum tube cookers. Uh, these have been fairly recent. If you're on Facebook and you've ever plugged in the phrase solar cooker, you maybe got an ad about two or three years ago for the Kickstarter campaign for the Go Sun. Uh, they had two or three models that came out and the most recent one there in the middle uh, or in the bottom there with the, the solar panel, you can actually hook up the panel to charge a battery pack. And the tray will actually has a heating element underneath which you slide out of the vacuum tube and slide back in with your food and plug into the battery when the sun goes down or it's night or the, or the clouds roll in. Uh, very effective kind of a hybrid for the uh, 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 vacuum tube cookers. The one on the left made in China. Uh, one problem with that design is it's set up so that you have to tip it, tip it uh, toward the sun vertically as well as uh, horizontally uh, to keep it in focus, whereas the Fusion uh, just sets flat and you just uh, slide it around and, and uh, tip the reflectors around the cook pot. Um, it's kind of a new thing. It's a big raging debate in the solar cooking community is is it practical for anything besides countries like the U.S., where it's fairly expensive to make, uh, very powerful, but it's, you just don't know if you can ship them overseas or if they can make them in countries without the resources, uh, which is a whole thing I'll talk about toward the end of my presentation. Uh, for now, lens cookers, these are, uh, these are uh, interesting. The one on the right, uh, that's Bing Du in uh, Sacramento. He's the inventor of it. And it's about the only uh, Fresnel lens cooker that I would trust anyone to use. The reason being, uh, you know, if you've had a friend who's taken a Fresnel lens out of a, a rear projection TV uh, and you set it up and you tip it till the focal point is about an inch across on your deck, it'll be one second and that deck will burst into flames. Very powerful, uh, very concentrated light. Uh, it's just a thin sheet of plastic with the, with the angle of a, of a, a uh, Fresnel lens uh, cut into it. Uh, so that it can focus like that. The one on the left, Heliac in Denmark, uh, they actually originally sent, uh, uh, sent people plans with a wooden frame, but if you don't tend to it, that focal point will move on you, and they found too many people <laughs> burnt down their own cookers. So the design, very powerful, and uh, when you use it properly and kept, it, uh, uh, kept tending to it with the food and then uh, tipped it up so it's under the shade that's there at the top, uh, it's a perfectly fine cooker, but they had to change their plans uh, to include a metal frame, because the, the wood frame was just too hazardous. Um, uh, here's one that I made. Uh, one thing you can do with it is if you set it up so that the Fresnel lens is far enough away from flammables, you're probably going to be pretty safe. I've actually since lined my 2x4 framing with aluminum foil, so if that focal point wanders at all, it should reflect back to the cooking area or diffuse it, so, it not, so I don't burn down my deck. Um, uh, this is uh, just a cautionary tale. If you ever get into designing cookers and you get into Fresnels and uh, uh, parabolics, the picture on the right is a two by four that was on my deck fence. And uh, I have two Fresnel or two uh, parabolic cookers, the SK14 and the 750. And the 750 got tipped over in a rainstorm. I didn't know it till it was too late. The next day I come out and it had already burnt that uh, char on a two by four that was on my, on my uh, fence. It was, I was intending to put a shelf on that thing. Fortunately, it had rained and soaked the board so it didn't, uh, it didn't burn down my fence. Uh, but I keep that on my garage door as the warning to make sure I'm really careful when I put out these uh, parabolics and Fresnel cookers. Uh, just to mention a few crossover cookers too, I just mentioned kind of the five basic designs that are out here. Here's kind of a crossover. It's kind of a box cooker because the inside is, uh, is insulated. Uh, Sam Rulon uh, in Washington State uh, put this together. It's glass, octagonal uh, reflectors, 
uh, and then an octagonal glass dome, and then a little uh, tray that uh, you can adjust for the height of the, of the cook pot. Uh, it will hit uh, 400 to 450 degrees. When I uh, found one used online maybe 10 years ago and set it out immediately, it was within 15 minutes, it was at 425 degrees. Very effective design. Uh, the story is that Sam Rowan actually took a, a laser pointer from, you know, for presentations and held it uh, around to make sure that the laser dot uh, hit the cooking area, where whatever angle uh, it was at, depending on the, the angle of the sun. Um, another one, this one's one of my favorites, uh, Sun Dish, uh, Milan Kulkarni out of India. Uh, the great thing about this is uh, when I was at the uh, solar cooking conference in Portugal, I uh, facilitated a discussion about promoting solar cooking. And uh, there were a few guys there from uh, Madrid who said, well, it's really hard for us because we're in an apartment building. And uh, so we really can't even do any cooking. Well, that's exactly the point that uh, Kulkarni came up with this for is uh, you can hang this out your window or on your, uh, on your uh, patio, your uh, balcony deck in an apartment building. And so long as you catch enough sun for part of the day, you can have like two or three hours. You can have an east facing window or an uh, uh, equator facing window or west, and you'll still be able to cook for a few hours a day. Uh, and I have mounted on my second the second floor window uh, that leads to my wife's office. So on occasion, she'll put her lunch in at about nine o'clock and by about 12.30 or one, she'll have a, a full course lunch. Uh, another one, this one, Arliss Walters, he's a retired turkey farmer in uh, Oklahoma. And most of you probably recognize what's going on there. It's a convection oven where it's just copper pipes filled with mineral oil. And uh, just that box alone, there's no reflectors uh, it will get up to upwards of 280, 290 degrees, and once the sun goes down, it will still retain most of that heat because of the mineral oil, probably for an hour or two before it will get down to about uh, boiling uh, temperature. Uh, well, I already had that one, Solar Chef, Sam Ruin. Um, okay, so, uh, oh, and I should have mentioned at the beginning, uh, if you have questions, I guess I would recommend uh, using the message function to uh, get to get to the host, and then he can... Uh, read them off at the end, uh, or we can turn on all the microphones at the end and any questions you have, if you have to answer them. Um, so why bother? Why would we even want to cook solar, uh, especially in what I called in my title of this presentation, <clears throat> the variety weather belt. Those of us in Minnesota will know you could go two weeks with total clouds and rain, or two weeks with sun, or every other day of which way, uh, as opposed to Albuquerque or Phoenix or, you know, Barstow, California, where you got 300 days of sun, you can practically uh, set your watch to it and, uh, and cook all the time. Uh, well, it's great here anyway, because you can cook a lot. There's plenty of times when you can cook. And if you get a good uh, variety of cookers, uh, for instance, a parabolic, you only need about an hour to cook a decent meal uh, with it uh, because it's such high power. Um, the great thing about solar cooking just in general is, especially for us in the States, uh, if you have a garden, well, you cook while you're out in the garden. So you're already out there. Rather than having to run inside and outside to do it, uh, you can cook while you're doing your yard work. Or as I like to say, uh, you get your honey-do list while you're doing that in the garage, or just uh, check out your food every now and again. Uh, obviously, fresh air. Um, and if you want your neighbors to really uh, wonder what you're up to, uh, set up one of these parabolics and they'll wonder if you're communicating with aliens or what have you. Uh, and then last but not least, of course, energy bills. I mean, if you have an electric stove, unless you've got one of those uh, new, uh, uh, I forget what they're called, but where it's kind of the magnetic uh, type thing, which are fairly efficient, uh, you're paying a lot for that electricity uh, to cook. Well, this will save you that and, of course, natural gas. The rest of the world, well, the bottom photo is actually the sun stove I mentioned earlier. Those are three different designs of it. The most uh, common one that they make is the one in the middle with the printing press plates. Uh, but they've also done them where they're circular, where they have kind of that semi-parabolic, flat parabolic uh, reflector inside. Um, but the benefits out to the rest of the world, and this is the big challenge for Solar Cookers International and for organizations that are trying to get cookers there or make them there, distribute them. Uh, deforestation. Uh, I teach a course at Metropolitan State uh, in public and nonprofit administration. And uh, obviously, there are a lot of countries that that's the big challenge. Brazil right now, how much of their, forest, their Amazon rainforest are they losing uh, due to converting it to ranch land? Um, deforestation that uh, is really uh, a lesser good use and, of course, affects global warming and so forth. 
So that's a huge one. Uh, I, one of the illustrations I use in my class is uh, Madagascar, which is down to probably less than half of its original forest, uh, rainforest in the uh, mountains uh, from, uh, what, 30, 40 years ago. That's how fast it's been deforested. And all the problems that come with that, you know, landslides from the uh, land not being able to hold the water and so forth. Uh, in Latin America, I had a sister-in-law who did some research on the health problems caused by indoor cooking fires in Guatemala. Well, this is uh, common around the world where they cook inside, uh, both for safety, they feel it's maybe a little more efficient, it's more private. Um, but the fact is, is unless they have incredibly good uh, ventilation, uh, they suffer from huge uh, respiratory issues. Uh, so it's a big issue around the world. Uh, last, not last and not least, but this is the, these are the big three. The last one I know, this is their waterborne diseases. Uh, the water is, uh, in a lot of areas of the world, it's not polluted, but it's, it's uh, carrying uh, bugs, insects, uh, diseases, that uh, being able to pasteurize it with a solar cooker when you're out in the, out in the bush and not having to use uh, forest, you know, a deforest to be able to heat it up uh, is really critical. And uh, so the pictures on the right <coughs> are two versions of a water pasteurization indicator, also called a WAPI for short. Uh, the bottom illustrates how it works. You put that in where it's hung into the water, where the wax, it's a wax that melts at about 170 degrees, 180 degrees. And so once it melts and falls to the bottom, then you know the water has hit that temperature where it's killing all the waterborne germs. Uh, it obviously won't remove pollutants, uh, but when you're just taking it from a, a stream that maybe has, you know, dead animals or uh, mosquitoes, larvae, that kind of stuff, uh, the WAPI is really uh, a nice little tool to add uh, to the solar cooking uh, package for people to reduce those diseases. Um, <clears throat> uh, so how do I get, it, uh, get the word out to everyone else? Um, I've been really uh, deep into this for about the last two or three years, but gradually building up to where I've uh, developed uh, my own way of promoting it. Um, the first thing, of course, is if you're really still not familiar with solar cooking, uh, get on to solarcooking.org. That's the wiki of uh, that's put together by Solar Cookers International. It is just plain exhaustive. You almost don't have to go anywhere else. It has so many of the different uh, manufacturers, designers. It has probably you know a hundred plans that you can use to make your own cookers with. Uh, and then solarcookers.org. That's the SCI actual website for their organization. The, the plans that they have for uh, outreach, uh, for promoting solar cooking around the world, uh, and so forth. Um, next, uh, host solar gatherings. Um, I've had uh, luck last year before COVID, uh, I had eight or nine uh, solar bunches, where if like today, if it looked like it'd be sun from about nine in the morning to two or three in the afternoon on the following Saturday, two days later, <coughs> I will call a bunch. I'll literally email it to, I got about 150 people on my list now, a lot of them are just neighbors of mine, but some of them are, for instance, uh, uh, sustainability uh, environmental groups in Minneapolis uh, that that will attend and take it back to their folks. Um, I have neighbors that have shown up with friends who aren't on my list, and the next day I hear that they ordered a solar cooker. Uh, I literally put out as many cookers as I can stand and, and tend to. Um, I have as many of them cooking stuff in them as possible so I can show them how it works. And uh, I invite people to bring their own dishes to cook. And I'll give them the most appropriate cooker and put it right in there and it'll get going. My favorite story from this is the second brunch I had, a family brought their two daughters and each brought their one little egg. <laughs> and they both fried their egg, had their egg, and then the next brunch they came back with a big bucket of cookie dough. So I knew that I converted two, those are two girls about eight and 10 years old. Well, they're gonna be solar cooking. You know it, uh, they're believers. Uh, so hosting it in a real relaxed atmosphere, uh, that's really, it's wonderful. It's one or two people at a time. I've had as many as 15 over the course of the four hours of the brunch. Uh, and I, I just have a blast. Uh, demonstrate solar cooking at farmer's markets, street fairs. In Minneapolis, we have these open streets events. Uh, they, I believe they've canceled them this year. I know that they're thinking of possibly doing the one in, on Nicollet in September, October. I think it's been canceled. But that was my big plan this year was to get to as many of them as possible. Uh, get about four or five cookers out on a little patch on the on the street and uh, bring as much beans and rice and simple things to cook so uh, to demonstrate it as possible. Uh, it's a very simple way to do it. You'll see a lot of people will pass by. 
Uh, even if they don't stop, sometimes they'll stop and look and while someone else asks questions, uh, but you can educate a lot of people, at least on a surface level that way. And then uh, again, not last and not least, but uh, we have set up a Minnesota Solar Cookers Group. A friend of mine in Oakdale actually set it up and we both uh, uh, co-moderated. Um, that's so we can talk to people about, yes, you can cook at a 40, 50 degree latitude, uh, even in the variety weather belt. Uh, it's not that hard. And uh, the tips that we can pass on. Um, check in with the groups that really want to uh, live out their green uh, lifestyle, environmentalists, but also like tiny house folks. My friend in uh, Oakdale, he's building a tiny house and the solar cooker, perfect. He wants to be as off the grid as possible, something that takes up very little space. He actually has a simplicity and a couple panel cookers, and he's uh, he feels like he's good to go. And uh, schoolies, you've probably heard of people that convert uh, school buses into their own homes. They're kind of like tiny, tiny houses on wheels. Uh, preppers, people, you know, some are in, into it to be ready for the zombie apocalypse or, you know, social unrest, and some are just, you know, they really want to be ready in case of a natural disaster. Uh, those are people sometimes, most of them will actually be pretty aware of solar cooking, uh, but to get them involved with your own outreach uh, is just extending that educational arm. Um, and this is just the last picture on the the left is uh, one of my uh, solar breakfasts that I made in the simplicity. <clears throat> uh, I think it was uh, last year in the spring, you know, complete breakfast, a hearty breakfast. And on the right, uh, my wife's folks live with us, and uh, this is one meal where everything on the plates and the whole on the whole table was cooked with solar cookers. Uh, basically, set out a couple things at noon, another thing about three o'clock, uh, brought them all in, and set them right on the table. Um, so that's another way to just do it with family, get family involved. Um, that's, you know, that's in a nutshell. I've tried to keep it short and sweet, uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, those are the websites, solarcookers.org and solarcooking.org. And uh, my email address, um, I think that might have been in the promo, but uh, I can always send it out too. Uh, so any, any questions? Um, hi, thanks, that was great. That's pretty amazing. Um, I'm, I'm Chris, and um, uh, I am, you're probably familiar with the book Drawdown. I don't know, are you? Drawdown.org? Mm -hmm. And you are the solar cookers are number 21 on, on, on the, out of 80 in terms of solutions to global warming. Oh, sure. So I'm, I'm very interested in that. It seems like such a simple simple solution it's so high on the list and it's because of all your comments about well third world you know developing countries in particular sure. in fact uh, on the solar cookers international site uh they have the list of the united nations sustainability uh factors or goals of something on the order of a dozen or 20 factors and sci makes the case that it meets all of them that it just it plain meets all of them uh, as far as sustainability, you know, reducing deforestation, public health. The one thing I didn't mention uh, that I remember when I first got the Solar Cookers International um, newsletter is uh, the one article was uh, started off with the headline, Solar Cookers Prevent Rape. And I thought, okay, now I've, now I've, <laughs> I've hit the real rock job. Uh, you know, but they made the point that in refugee camps where you to, if you have to go to collect cooking fuel outside the camp, you're basically entering a war zone. And with you know the, the kids getting kidnapped, turned into child soldiers, uh, women getting raped and murdered, and, uh, and absolutely, it's something where, you know, it's a no-brainer when you think about it, is that if they don't have to leave the camp and they can cook their own food in the camp, they're gonna be safe, you know? Uh, so there's just any number of things, uh, you know, about every two or three months, someone else comes up with, uh, here's another reason it should be done, and just then we try to promote it. So I'm glad you mentioned that book. It's very important for people to know that. I have one other. I have one other comment. Um, or I have a one of the squirt box cookers. Yes. Um, and you know the double pots. You know two pots fit in there, and yep. it's great. But if I bought, if I, I would like to have one other cooker. One other cooker besides that. So for, you know, handling a complete meal. Sure. What would you recommend for just one more cooker after that? Sure. Well, the, the one that uh, I'm, I'm infamous for on the Solar Cooking Facebook pages is the, the simplicity. 
uh, made by Alan, Alan Vivas, A-L-A-I-N-B-I-V-A-S. Uh, oh, that F collapsible one. Yeah, simplicity.fr, just like simplicity, only simplicity. Uh, he, has, he has designed a cooker that has, I cannot think of a single wasted piece of, uh, you know, metal on it. His philosophy is he, ha he wants no plastic. The only plastic is this little focusing ring. Actually, I'll bring it up here because it's cool. Focus the. You see in the back there. Yeah. Basically, when you set up the cooker, you adjust the the frame uh, or the reflector so that a dot goes through a little hole in the reflector, and this dot of sunlight hits the bullseye. If it's right in the center, it's perfectly focused. But because it's a deep parabola, meaning the pot is below the plane of the, the circle at the top, uh, it doesn't have to be perfectly focused. If you set it within the third ring or close, or within the third, two, the third, I'm sorry, the inner three rings, <laughs> you set it ahead by like a half an hour and you don't have to refocus it every 10 minutes like you have to do with uh, usually the bigger, uh, more intense focused uh, parabolas. It's on the order of, I'm thinking uh, $400 uh, to ship it from France, uh, but it's entirely aluminum uh, with a couple of steel parts. Uh, it's going to last forever. This has taken a tumble off of my snow banks uh, when I've been cooking in the winter. Very versatile. Uh, you can cook a, you know, a cup of rice in about, I'm thinking, 45 minutes. You know, so if you have, um, you know, right, uh, like a uh, paella type thing, uh, you can cook that in 45 minutes or an hour. Uh, you can fry with it, it'll fry with just an egg or two, 15, 20 minutes maximum. Uh, I mean, even if you're cooking that, if you just put the pan in the oil, I'm thinking probably, you know, five minutes for an egg. Uh, my wife's folks have a cabin up north where we, every 4th of July, we go up there. And uh, with all my uh, cousins and uh, in-laws coming over, I just set it out as soon as the sun rises <clears throat> and with a pot of water, and I poach eggs two or three at a time as everyone wakes up because it's vacation, you know, two or three <laughs> at a time. You know, poached egg. They go back in with their toast or whatever. Um, I would say this, I, what I tell people is, uh, you know, when people say, what book would you bring to a desert island if you were stranded on a desert island? And I'd say, no book, get a simplicity because you want to cook some food. <laughs> you know, what good is a book going to do you, you know? Uh, so that's the one. Otherwise, <laughs> you know, cooker, uh, the Copenhagen uh, by Stern Clausen. Uh, she has the plans that she sells her own uh, uh, version of it, uh, which is great, but she also uh, provides the plans online. She's, she wants to promote solar cooking bottom line uh, so much that she does that. Uh, Roger Haynes uh, puts wait out a second. A Wait a second, you're going a little fast. So that was the Copenhagen? And uh, Sharon Clausen in San Diego invented that. Uh, named, of course, for the Copenhagen Accord from several years ago for about the environment. Um, it's a panel cooker, uh, so it's a slow cooker. Um, and then uh, Roger Haynes, also in the San Diego, San Diego area, uh, he's a retired federal prosecutor, but uh, he's put together a panel cooker that I use a lot to, to boil beans, because I'll put out uh, a cup and a half of beans with you know, four cups of water. It'll, it'll start simmering in about an hour, and it'll simmer all day. Uh, amazing. It's, uh, actually, I have it here, too. I'll bring this over. I've been using the Haynes one too, and it really works. And then it collapses into a small, uh, small box for storage. So, what do you look up, Roger Haynes? Yep. Uh, if you want to look it up. Yeah, and here's the Roger Haynes cooker. Roger and uh, Haynes. basically, he has a polycarbonate sleeve that just sets in the middle, and he includes uh, usually with the package you can get a, a Dutch oven that sets in the sleeve, which holds it about an inch off the bottom, so the light. From what's effectively a, 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 a uh, it's a windshield cover uh, protector, you know, where it uh, uh, that's the material, but very reflective uh, and very flexible. It's almost a parabola on its own, but it's a soft parabola because of the flat, flat uh, surfaces, you know, trapezoids and so forth. And that uh, and that and that folds up. Uh, yes, uh, Roger. Yeah, it folds up too. It folds up into maybe an inch thick thing by about uh, two and a half feet by about a foot. Uh, yeah, about a foot. Uh, very, it's like nothing. It's a, you, you have to put something in it before the wind kicks up <laughs> or it'll blow into the neighbor's yard. <laughs> mm. 
Yeah, that's that's great. Um, um, I I just asked Chris if she could copy what she wrote down into the chat for so everybody else can uh, maybe uh, refer back to it. Um, oh, if you no, missed anything, I, I heard I heard him say if I had one other choice, he gave me three ideas. That <laughs> simplicity. The Copenhagen and the Roger Haynes cooker. Yep. Right. Yep. And uh, my email address, if you want, I've got a, a PowerPoint with my entire collection of cookers. I've passed the 60, I have more than 60 now. I'm going to be picking up two more on my trip out west in about a month. And uh, I have a spreadsheet where I kind of rank them as far as their usability, power, uh, uh, if they're still being manufactured and so forth. My email address, Krugerian, which is K-R-U-E-G-E-R-I-A-N, at gmail.com. So my last name plus I-A-N, as in that was a Krugerian thing to say. <laughs> um, Krugerian at gmail.com. Happy to send you everything I got. Uh, and if you're interested in being on our list for the solar brunches, I'm actually putting together a, hopefully a, a COVID safe uh, brunch package where people can enter from the back and go to a kind of a dining area getting their own utensils while I cook on the other side of the deck. Uh, and then just, you know, social distancing and all that. Uh, I really want to do that. I'm really hoping Sunday I might be able to do a solar tea time, do, do basically the same thing in the afternoon. Got to watch that uh, forecast. <clears throat> but if you want to be on that list uh, too, uh, I'd be happy to send you the invitations. Yeah, I just posted your, your email and uh, um, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd be interested. Great. Yeah, where are you? But are you live, are in South Minneapolis or where yep, is South that? Minneapolis? If you know the Lake and Nicollet area with uh, <clears throat> the Kmart, you know, five blocks at 35th and First Avenue. Oh, great! Yeah, and you can't miss it if you cross 35th and First. Oh. The big purple house with 22 solar panels on the roof. Yeah, I think it's it's kind of a landmark. Uh, you're on the solar tour too, or you, you have been, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I I think I'm going to be on the next one <clears throat> coming up. Yeah, great. <laughs> well, Luther, um, question, when you have these solar gatherings, have you ever uh, done popcorn for people? Does that work? Uh, you can do popcorn. I have never done it, but uh, there are people that have posted online how they've made them. <clears throat> oh, and Bivots in uh, France uh, has done it a bunch of times. Uh, it's basically the same. It's ideally to be in a parabolic where you get the high heat a lot quicker or you get the oil heated up before you put the popcorn in. Uh, but it works. It works just as well as on a on a gas range. Okay. Then another question: do, do you ever just try to heat a bunch of water so you're ready to go whenever you want it, instead of having to pre-plan this? Like you go to work, you get your thing heating the water, come home, and you boil stuff. Yes, actually, uh, one of the first things I did uh, with this SK14 parabolic was I wanted to cook risotto, and uh, the way you cook risotto is you got to keep. Uh, stock <clears throat> hot on the side and then keep ladling in stock as the rice absorbs the stock. And so I'd have the SK750, which is about half the size, but we keep the stock at a simmer. And once the uh, stock was absorbed in the big parabolic, I would just ladle in the, ladle in the already boiling uh, stock. Um, but I've done that also just for uh, tea, hot, uh, for co uh, coffee. Um, yeah, yeah. It's uh, and the parabolic is the way to go, the, the simplicity. You about a quart of water, probably about a half an hour. You got it hot enough for coffee, if not actually boiling. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. How do you keep track of the temperature uh, or monitor it or adjust it? Sure. For box cookers, you just put a regular oven thermometer inside. Uh, the caution, of course, is the, the, these, these portable ones, uh, they can be kind of fudgy. If you get like three or four, put them all in the same cook at the same time. And if one of them is like way off, put that one, throw that one out. <laughs> and then at least the three that have pretty much the same reading, you know, they're probably pretty close to accurate. Um, one of the philosophies uh, of some in the solar cooking world is to throw out the thermometer. Uh, you should be able to know from the amount of sun and the type of cooker and seeing whether you've got a simmer going or steam rising in the pot and so forth, that that's more than enough. Uh, I think we still all mostly need that reassurance, seeing the needle move <laughs> and getting up into the 200 plus range so we know we're not going to have botulism. Um, so uh, so just using an ordinary oven thermometer. Uh, for parabolics, of course, it's uh, you can't really just put that in there because it's a really hot surface, but it's going to transfer to the pot. But you can get those infrared 
the thermometers. You know, with the dot, and it'll give you the digital reading if you yeah. really want. The Point and shoot. That's yeah. The other the other thing I just wanted to mention to everybody is that Barbara wrote an article on Luther, and it's going to be in a national trade magazine coming out uh, later in August. It's uh, Aces, and it's a uh, it's uh, Solar Today is the name of the magazine. So uh, we're going to be getting some copies of that in our office. So if you guys want a copy, please let me know. <coughs> Thank you, Barb. Terry, come on. You've got a question. I know you do. Yes, I've been using my solar oven and SOS Sport since 2005. And I love it. I cook you know, right from the garden and, you know, I'm looking because I've been doing it for 15 years. I'm looking for some new recipes. Uh, where would you recommend? I've got, you know, I, I go online and stuff, but is there a source of recipes? You know, there's, uh, there are some, if you Google them, um, you know, if you just Google solar cooking recipe books, there's probably six or seven of them where the authors are selling them themselves. Uh, I'm thinking of Jennifer Stein Barker in, uh, <clears throat> in uh, Oregon. The morning, I think it's the Morning Hill Solar Cooking uh, Recipe Book. Uh, Morning Hill Farms, that's uh, what they call it. Their, their place is uh, pretty much off the grid. The only thing that's on the grid is that for their internet, they have the, they still have the DSL. They're in the very rural area of Oregon. Um, that one's a good uh, cookbook for the sake of, her philosophy is making sure most of it is vegetarian, not to say you gotta be vegetarian, but that you don't have as much worry about uh, uh, you know, botulism and, and uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, it's, it's just safer to say, here's a recipe. Because one thing that can happen, they talk about it among circles that are promoting solar cooking. People have a bad experience with a solar cooker, uh, they write it off and they'll discourage other people from, from doing it. And so if they have a bad meal or it doesn't cook right, they don't follow the instructions, it's bad. Well, obviously, if you send your guests home and they're sick <laughs> from your food, that's not good. Uh, but that's one we have. Uh, my wife and I use that uh, frequently. And, but the thing to know is, basically, you can cook anything. We have a challenge on the World Network Facebook page, uh, basically a solar cooking challenge of what dishes just are so, seem to be so complex or, or fancy that, oh, you couldn't possibly cook that in a solar cooker. Sarah Hjalmarsson is a solar cooker and chef in Sweden, uh, higher latitude than us, and she solar cooks. And we came up with a list at the conference in Portugal in January, including stuff like souffles, uh, or you know, just things that you think, oh, that, that you can't do it. Well, you can, and we're knocking them off one at a time. Um, what's the one, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, like pizzas, the ones that take really high heat. Well, like a Fresnel cooker can actually heat up a granite stone to the kind of heat that you want uh, for a Neapolitan pizza, you know. Um, you can cook just about anything. I would say just any cookbook, use the recipe, uh, but just understand, as you as you probably understand with the box cooker, with the the sport, it's just that uh, you might double the time as far as your expectation. You know, so if you're having chocolate chip cookies and it says, you know, 375 degrees for for 45 minutes, well, I'll give it 90 minutes because it's probably gonna it's the temp is gonna go down to like 250 and gradually creep back up. It'll take longer, but so what? And uh, so just use you know use any recipe, uh, and if you have to sear something, well, uh, parabolic is the way to go. Baking in the sun oven is, uh, is like uh, you, you can you do it in your sleep, you know. Um, the, the, uh, even parabolics, if you set up a double boiler, you can bake in them. You know, even though they're really high heat, you just set up a double boiler and you can put cookies or cake inside the double boiler. Uh, I've done uh, uh, custards that way on the, on the simplicity, where I just have a little pot of water and then put the three or four custards in there, a lid on the top, and I got custard in about an hour. So, uh, yeah, so just try any recipe, just understanding that the time frame is going to be longer, maybe a little bit longer if it's on a parabolic, uh, maybe a, quite a bit longer if it's a, a panel cooker. Here, how do you adjust to winter? Uh, I'm sure that's a challenge here. Uh, for winter, the main thing is to understand that the, you aren't going to get as high a temp as you do like in the middle of June because the sun is going through more atmosphere being at a lower angle, so more of the power of that light is kind of getting filtered out. Uh, obviously, the sunlight is, you know, maybe seven, eight hours a day where you might be able to use it versus 10, 12 hours a day like you can in the uh, tip of summer. Uh, but you can still cook in the winter. Like I mentioned, Sarah Helmerson, they're in Sweden. She's at, I think, the 57th degree uh, latitude. 
Uh, she's cooking all the time, so we're using the parabolic and the, and the uh, vacuum tube cookers. There was a guy at the Portugal conference from the Northwest Territories in uh, Canada uh, who had a barrel cooker, and uh, he cooked all the time with it whenever there was sun, you know? So, um, so the adjustment is basically you probably have to start later. You have to plan earlier and get, start, get started as soon as you have enough usable sun to, to cook the food. Uh, and just expect that you might have to cook all day. <laughs> right, right. And I suppose the ambient air is, is that much of a factor once you, you get into the... You know, it's not that zone. much. Um, with, with, with box cookers, uh, with the, especially if you get like the, like the Solar Oven Society Sport, that's that double pane, basically, the kind of the thermal uh, layer of the air, uh, that helps retain the heat better. Um, you have, it's also built so you can have a, a winter angle, so you can tip it up where it's... Uh, facing the sun closer to the horizon uh, to start the cooking day uh, and maybe cook that way all day. Um, so I've not found that it's been a big deal. I don't cook quite as often because I just don't, I'm not as eager to get out in the zero degree weather. But with the simplicity, uh, like I say, I've done breakfast in the winter. I just say, you know what, I want to do it. I got the sun, I've got enough and that thing does it. So I just go out there and do it. Right. So you're taking them ice fishing so you can cook the fish right there on the <laughs> lake. Or... I, I have I have to admit, maybe to my shame, I'm a Minnesotan, but uh, I've never ice fished. Uh, but I've camped in uh, in uh, sub sub freezing temperatures anyway, and uh, maybe someday. <laughs> yeah, it's um, good to leave some challenges for. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Well, I just wanted to say that Doug uh, and I led a workshop, a global warming workshop, for three days over with a group of kids over at McGizzy, a support group for Native American kids. And we went out uh, to uh, uh, Nature Center and we had two solar cookers and we cooked corn, sweet corn, left it in the, you know, took the, the, the silk out, but left it, you know, kind of tied into the leaves. Yep. And, and um, it was delicious because we could really pack, you know, a lot into, the, into those pans and um, had enough for everybody. Yeah, in fact, that uh, reminds me of the one book I always recommend if you're going to get a book on solar cooking, written in 1998, so it doesn't have the have uh, the uh, vacuum tube cookers. Um, uh, Joe Radabaugh, I actually visited him in Mount Shasta. Uh, one thing um, he points out about that is, uh, you, well, I'm losing my train of thought here. Sorry, I've been baking in the sun all day. <laughs> what was the original statement? What's the name of the book? Oh, it's called The Heaven's Flame. Heaven's Flame. Oh, and uh, uh, he's, he, brings up, uh, he brings up all the cookers that basically existed back then. He wrote, he really physically wrote letters to these makers and promoters around the world and had them send photos uh, of all their cookers. Great. Just, a, just another thing I wanted to share with all of you is that today I hooked up Luther with the guy who was going down the river with the boat and uh, and uh, we're going to try to get a, a solar cooker on on the boat and uh, show that that you can cook uh, going down the river. <laughs> oh, oh, I got an extra solar oven society sport that uh, he's welcome to borrow. I've got an extra sun oven, you know, whatever it takes. I think the sport is the ideal because it's a. Uh, I think on the boat you're talking about it says uh, a pontoon. Boat, yeah, yeah, it's a pontoon. A flat surface and you got you know pretty steady waters. Uh, that'll be great. Well, this has been great. Any other questions? If not, uh, Rich will have, have this recorded and up on YouTube in, what, 30 days, Rich, you think? Uh, yeah, maybe sooner. Okay, fantastic. And share it, share it with friends and stuff. I, I have a strong feeling that we had a lot more people that wanted to get in on it. We just had the problem with the connection. But uh, it, uh, Luther, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And uh, we, have a, we have a small token of appreciation. We have a, a solar battery charger unit for your cell phone that we're going to get to you. Great. And, uh, our, our little way of saying thank you. And, and uh, thank you, everybody, for showing up. The uh, MRES group will reconvene at 7.30 on uh, Mr. Weber's uh, channel at that point. So thanks again, everybody. Talk to you soon. Thanks so Good. much. Thanks, Luther. Thank you. Thanks, Luther. Yeah. Take care, all.